Um, is that what you expect to see down there, down in the bottom of the ocean also? Yeah, that's, I think that's a true, true experiment. That actually happened. It's crazy. Um, this is why I hold the unpopular opinion that we should not send probes to <laughs> distant planets until we sterilize our probes very, very well because life has an amazing way of proliferating. Um, yeah, I don't know about alcohols. I haven't looked into that. But, you know, the... I'm sure there are some. The cell membranes are not by any means uniform. There's a bunch of lipids. They have some of them have sugars. Some of them have all sorts of different things mixed together, and they're also pretty fluid. So the molecules can move around from one to another. Some of them flip. Um, there are some proteins embedded in the membrane, and that's how they can sense things. You know, they'll have like kind of receptor, and then a nutrient will stick to it, and they'll be able to grab it and bring it into the cell. Um, so I'm not sure about the relative proportion of alcohols. But so they can grab from their environment uh, whatever they need to armor themselves against extreme environments? Um, I don't know about armoring, but they can definitely bring things into the cell. Yeah. Because yeah. I think uh, some of them actually, I guess, they, they, they turn hard, I think, right? They're so there's something called sporulation. Yeah. Spor oh, yes. So they can make bacterial spores, which are a real problem, especially in hospitals and even um, in labs. We have something called an autoclave, which is what we use to sterilize. Um, all of our glassware, make sure we're actually growing the bacteria we think we're growing. Um, and it's basically this like heat and pressure chamber that um, you know wipes everything out. But sometimes spores can survive that. So you have to have like a special cycle on the autoclave and a special team to make sure that they die. Yeah. I guess that brings up the question of when you're doing your sampling, when you're doing your testing, how do you know you're not modifying the bacteria in the process of testing? in the process of bringing it up to be examined, or in the process of doing whatever analysis you have to do? Yeah, that's a huge problem. So especially, for the example, when I was on the Mariana Trench trip, um, we were you know, outside of Guam. It was really warm outside. And we wanted to know what these bacteria were like in the deep ocean. But as soon as you get them out on the ship, they're like, what's going on? It's really hot. Like, I'm going to change all of my RNA. I'm going to make different proteins. Um, and so you have to just like, as soon as they get on the ship, like throw them in an ice bath, run as fast as you can into a refrigerator and start filtering it really fast. And that's how I got locked into a refrigerating room <laughs> in my shorts <laughs> several times. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a real problem. Um, did, not did you find your room. DNA changing as a result of that experience? <laughs> Getting locked into the refrigerator? <laughs> <laughs> my RNA definitely. <laughs> my DNA probably not. Yeah, so it's not as big of a problem if you want to know what their DNA is because, you know, that's pretty constant. But if you want to know how they're reacting, then um, you have to get at it pretty fast, which is why I feel really lucky to have my environmental sample processor data set because it's floating along with the current, so it's just preserving them right there in the exact same temperature that, um, that it's been living in. Yeah. I had one question on your favorite slide in your deck. Oh, which one's that? The, the colorful one. Okay, tell me There was one that you said was really fantastic. <laughs> it showed the different bacteria. I'm sorry, in the different oceans. You should, that one. This one, ah, oh, yeah. So you found that one especially interesting. Can you tell me why? Oh, well, because I wouldn't expect you know, nature is really chaotic. <coughs> Ecology is really chaotic. It's really hard to pick out trends. And so the fact that these guys are behaving, you know, they're producing genes at the same time off of the coast of California, off the pier, as they would be in the middle of the North Pacific and in the same order. But they're the same species. Isn't that what you would expect? In fact, if they were the same species, wouldn't you expect them to be closer together rather than further apart? Well, I mean, so if you have like a group of tigers, you wouldn't expect them all to do the same thing, right? Like you don't expect, I mean, it's kind of like robotic in the way that they're reacting to their environment. Like it's the same time of day conserved over daily cycles. Like they have these habitual routines. Mm -hmm. And I think the really cool thing is that the order is the same which makes me think that this arctic bacterium needs this roseobacter. You know, like it's, it's not gonna be able to turn on its translation all the way until it gets something from the other, from the other guy that came before it, which 
you know, hasn't been proven yet, but that's certainly an impl implication. But that's a small subset of the microbes in each location, right? So these are the most abundant microbes. I see. But there are a lot of confounding factors. The other microbes, the water temperature. Yeah, that's why it's solidity. surprising that they're, they're patterned so well. You know, so like each of these dots could be happening on a different day, but it's gonna be at the same time. Hmm. This is pooled over several days. Hmm. So what's called the difference in slope? Is it just the kinetics are slower in the central ocean? Oh, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but that's actually a really good theory because Nutrients are a big problem in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. It's basically like a desert ecosystem for the ocean. Whereas here off the California coast, we get a lot of upwelling. So we have that nutrient rich cold water coming up to the surface and fertilizing everything. Yeah. And you notice some of the players are missing just because, you know, here the main photosynthetic guy is Ostreococcus, whereas here it's Prochlorococcus. So they're fulfilling the same role, but they're different species. Period of activity also because of the slope is different. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just the problem. Yeah. So are you leaving on your on your mission with some hypothesis that you're trying to prove, or are you just going to enjoy the salt air? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. I would, I would like for this to form a chapter of my thesis, so <laughs> I hope that it's not just enjoying the salt air. Um, I think it would really be cool if I could say what percent of the population is the same from the surface to depth. I think it would be really cool if I could correlate um, like the differences in the population with the water masses. So if, there, if there's like a saltier water mass, you can see more things responding to salt, or if there's a nutrient limited area, you can see the response to nutrient. And if you could see, um, you know, PUFA producers in the deep ocean versus the, the upper ocean. Yeah. What percent do you expect right now, based on other studies, regarding the percentage similar beach versus Do you expect about 10 percent? Yeah, um, I guess it's hard to answer that question because the species concept is so convoluted right. in bacteria. Right. Yeah. So if you're asking like what percent are the same species or what percent are the same genus or um, what percent like. Yeah. Well, that's what you're asking. Yeah, that's I know. what you just said is your main hypothesis, yeah, which yeah, I yeah. agree with, which is pretty exciting. Uh, to so, understand ecological diversity and how that changes throughout the water column. So I think I'd, I'd probably go after like specific folks and and ask that question for each of those. But um, yeah, I expect that there's pretty, there'd be pretty different communities. Also, a lot of what we know about the deep ocean comes from sediment communities, and so sediment communities are a whole other animal, right? Because they're a lot more dense. Um, question for on your last next to the last slide what is a salmon cannon oh. oh man I'm glad you asked now you guys all have to go to squidteams.com and find out um, so <laughs> there's a problem so salmon live half of their life in fresh water and half of it in salt water um, and so in order to get back to their freshwater ecosystems, they have to go upstream, right? This is how you have this typical picture of the bear grabbing the salmon and having a nice lunch. But um, there's been problems with salmon being able to get upstream um, because of human influence. And so they've devised this salmon cannon, which actually like, shoots them past the dams. One at a time, they swim into it, and it shoots them <laughs> into the river. You can see a full illustration of it in this comic. It's really well done. Somebody in my friend's autumn. Um, 
that's what it this is. This is something like real or this, this is, is a real this is no. in implementation, yeah. <laughs> and there was a grant that funded this, I'm sure. I don't know, maybe it was a public service project. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the bears are they going to be The Indians with their canoes. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Well, at least it's not frozen chickens. <laughs> it's got to be random shots with the canoes. <laughs> 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 we want them all hit the same place. <laughs> like the bird or something. You're right. <laughs> bears, I'll figure that out. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.